to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Acts chapter 5, verse number 29. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Acts. This is our second lesson, and we're thinking today about Acts chapter 5 through 8. Such a wonderful, exciting, powerful study in the book of Acts, and we're so glad that you joined us for that study today. If you don't have your Bible ready, if you don't have it handy and with you, we want you to take just a minute and locate your Bible as we're going to look to the Word of God in our study today. We're so glad that you joined us. Today's lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the churches of Christ. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night, Wednesday for Bible study. You will find people there who love God, who are concerned, about spiritual matters and who simply want men and women to go to heaven. If you've got a Bible question, you'd like to know more about the church or why they worship the way they do or God's plan of salvation, they'd be happy. Members of the Lord's Church in your area would be happy to sit down and discuss the scriptures with you. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ in your desire to know God and His will better. Please check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our material free of charge. We have lessons on every book of the Old Testament, every book of the New Testament, uh, a wide variety of topical lessons as well. Uh, you can access those, as we said, through our website, thegospelofchrist.com, or if you'd like to have a copy of this study on the book of Acts or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a free media request form. If you'd like to have a digital download instantly, we can make that available. Or if you need it on audio, a CD on audio or DVD for video, we can also provide that to you as well. And friend, we want to encourage you to check out our app, the Gospel of Christ app in available uh, respective play stores. Great way to keep up with what we're doing on the go as well. And don't forget to check us out on Facebook, like us and follow us on that also. Today we're thinking about Acts chapter 5 through 8. And in this series, in Acts chapters 5 through 8, some really amazing things happen in the book of Acts. Acts 5 begins with a very problematic scene. The gospel is starting to spread. Men and women are obeying that gospel. The church in Jerusalem is growing. But then there are two disciples who've got a problem with greed who do something they shouldn't do. And we're introduced to Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias, they're selling some of their goods. They're giving that to the church for the spread of the gospel. Ananias comes. They say, Ananias, did you sell this for such and such a price? Absolutely, this is what I sold it for. He lays it down to the apostles' feet. Ananias lied about that. He drops dead on the spot. A little while later, Sapphira, his wife, comes. They quiz her about this. Did you sell such and such, this property, for such and such? And, of course, she lied about it as well. They conceived together to lie to God, and the same men that carried her husband out dead, she dropped dead, and they carried her out as well. What was the whole point of all that? Don't lie to God. Don't try to fool God. Don't try to trick God. P Peter will even say, you could have taken with this money and done what you want with it. You could have kept some back. But the fact that you lied, probably to make themselves look better, and said that you gave it all to God was the problem. The church learned a powerful lesson. God's in control. God knows all things, and we must not lie to God or the apostles, and we must follow the teaching of God in his word. 
And friend, we've got to learn that today as well. Sometimes we think to ourselves, if I do this, nobody will ever know. If I, if I take part in this, God won't know and others won't know. And, and friend, that's really just not true. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Proverbs 15, 3. Uh, Hebrews 4.13, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. You're not going to trick God. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. And so let's be people of honesty. Let's follow God and do what he wants us to do. Then in Acts chapter 5, we now after this great miracle was done in Acts chapter 3, after the apostles spoke up boldly about that in Acts chapter 4, there's still a commotion that's going on because of that. And, and Peter and the other disciples, Peter and especially John, are now brought before the religious leaders and they, they talk about it and they basically say, we need to tell these guys to hush. We need to tell these men to stop promoting this new doctrine. It's kind of creating an uproar and that's going to hurt us and our position with the Roman government hurt our authority. And so they bring Peter in. They say, no more preaching about Jesus. And here's what Peter and the rest of the apostles say. They look at those men who have the power of life and death in their hand. And Peter and the rest of the apostles said, I'm sorry, but we got to obey God rather than men. Friend, how true and how well that lesson needs to resonate in our hearts and lives today. When people tell us no more preaching about Jesus. When people tell us on moral issues, Christians have to be quiet. You can't say that a man is a man and a woman's a woman. They were created that way by God. You can't say that there's only one scriptural reason for divorce and that's fornication. You can't teach that homosexuality is a sin against God. Romans 1 verses 26 through 29. When society tells us that to say that abortion is murder, you can't say that. That's wrong. My friend, we have to obey God. Regardless of the consequences, we must obey God rather than man. And here's why. On that final day, I'll stand before God and not men. I'll give an account of how I've lived my life in view of what God teaches. And thus, like Peter and the other apostles, we must obey God rather than men. Were there consequences to that? My friend, there were absolutely consequences to that. The apostles in Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 42, they, 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 they take these apostles, they, they beat them because uh, they want to make sure that they get the point of what they're trying to say. And those apostles, they didn't give up. They didn't throw in the towel. These apostles serve as an example of even in the face of persecution, how the world needs the, uh, the message of Jesus. They strictly warn them and they beat them not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And the Bible says in Acts 5 verse 42, and daily in the temple and from house to house, they cease not teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. When, the, when Peter and the rest of the disciples said, the disciples said in Acts 5 verse 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. Did they mean it? Yeah, they meant it when stripes were put on their back. Why in the world would, in the face of persecution, would Peter and the rest of the apostles do that after they've already taken physical abuse? Number one, because that's what God told them to do. And ultimately, they're going to please God. And number two, because they love these people. The only way these people who are lost, whom they love, including the people who beat them, could be saved was through the preaching of Jesus. Friend, doesn't that remind us of how we need to be evangelistic no matter what? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel, Matthew 28, verse 18. Him we preach, warning every man, teaching every man that we may present every man perfect in Jesus. Colossians 1 verse 24. We must proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If Jesus is the only way to be saved and if we stop preaching that, what's the conclusion? 
People aren't going to hear how to be saved, and people being saved is more important than pleasing men and facing, or not facing, persecution. Now, Acts chapter 6, as they continue to preach the gospel, you remember, they were daily in the temple preaching Jesus. Did that message have an effect? You bet it did. And on some very powerful religious people. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse number 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The persecution didn't stop the gospel. It's further being spread in Jerusalem. A lot of people are hearing that message and obeying the gospel and becoming Christians. And listen to this powerful statement. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, several things are taught from that. You must be obedient to the faith. You must obey from the heart that form of doctrine to which you are delivered. Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Obedience to God is essential to please Him. Jesus said, if you love me, Keep my commandments. John 14, verse 15. You are my friends if you, you do whatever I ask. John 15, verse 14. But then hear this. A great many of the priests, these are people who had officiated, who were close to the sacrifices of God every day who were helping the people every day, who were familiar with the laws of the Old Testament, and who were no doubt very familiar with God's prophecy and plan. When they heard about Jesus, a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. I wonder how that shook the Jewish system. I wonder when that priest who was serving those two weeks or that time period, there in Jerusalem at the altar of sacrifice, heard the message of Jesus, obeyed the gospel, and didn't show up tomorrow morning when it was time to offer sacrifice because he realized that was no more. Can you imagine the tidal wave that must have caused in the Jewish religion? Friend, that's the power of the gospel. But there's another thing that happens. At least it begins to happen in Acts chapter 6. Saul of Tarsus is now brought on the scene. And he's the, there's some, there, there, there's, this, uh, there's this synagogue of the freedmen of Tarsus, of the freedmen of Cilicia, and they're, they're being debated with by some of God's servants about the gospel. And so Stephen is now going to come on the scene. Very likely that Saul may have been part of, Saul of Tarsus may have been in that group who was debating with uh, Stephen there, and now in Acts, as Acts chapter 7 unfolds, we're going to hear about what Stephen did, what he said, how that became powerful in the church in Jerusalem and the impact that no doubt had. And so look in, if you would, Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrias, those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And so they couldn't resist it, so we're going to secretly now try to cause him to say or do things or get somebody to say something where they can do away with Stephen. But it's interesting, they couldn't resist the, the wisdom, the, the, the things he was saying, nor the spirit by which he spoke. He stood up and he plainly taught them from the Old Testament about Jesus as the Son of God from their own scriptures that they were looked up to as the leaders of, and they couldn't defeat that. Don't you know that must have been an embarrassment to them? They must have had an egg on their face, as it were. And so what did Stephen say when Acts chapter 7? We're going to learn specifically what Stephen said. Stephen's sermon in Acts chapter 7 is basically an unfolding of God's scheme of redemption through four major figures in history. He's going to begin in Acts chapter 7 right away 
with the father of the uh, of the Hebrew nation, the father of the uh, uh, Israel, uh, Abraham himself. And so it begins with Abraham. And he begins to talk about how God worked through Abraham, how God called Abraham. Genesis 12, get out of your country. I'll bless you and make you a great nation. In your seed, all nations will be blessed. And so he begins to talk about that blessing. He begins to talk about that seed. He begins to show the, the unfolding of God's scheme of redemption through Abraham and the seed promise. And then he moves to Joseph. You've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Joseph, God worked through him to bring Israel out of the, 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 the problems that we were having there and to make them a great nation. And God worked through Joseph just like he did Abraham. And that, that seed promise is continually made through Joseph. And then when God's people are in Egypt, have a little bit of rest, problems arise again. Egyptian bondage. And now in Acts chapter 7, there's that third figure that he's going to mention, Moses. And God used Moses to deliver his people out of Egyptian bondage. He'll mention the the things Moses did, the power with which he spoke, how God, through a strong hand, uh, set Israel free, took them through the Red Sea on dry land, crushed the Egyptians in there, and how God took them to Mount Sinai, gave them the, the, the commandments, uh, continued that seed promise, and eventually he's going to work that all the way up to Jesus Christ. Everything, everything God was doing, with Abraham about the seed promise. Everything God was doing with Joseph to, 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 to make them a great nation. Everything God did through Moses to lead them through out of Egyptian bondage, to give them the covenant, to give them that land of promise. All of this, Stephen says, is what God had planned to bring Jesus into the world. Listen to his climax. Acts chapter 7, beginning in verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern he had seen, which our fathers, having received in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you've now become betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. And so Stephen just kind of puts them on, on the edge of their seat and then he says, this temple that you want to put so much of your hope in, God's not dwelling in that and he never tend, never intended for that to be his ultimate home. God does not dwell in temples made with hands. And then he, he basically says, stop sticking your fingers in your ears and listen, this Jesus, the just one, the, that the prophets told about. You're the ones who rejected him. You're the murderers of him. And friend, they got that point. We need, we, we need more people in the body of Christ today, in the Lord's church, who will boldly say what Stephen said about God's plan, about how men and women need to hear the message of the Bible and who make it personal to the people who need to obey the gospel and hear that message. God is not just like then. So today, so many people, like in the days of the Jews, so many people get caught up in some beautiful edifice, some beautiful building. Oh, look at the ornate Greek or Roman architecture. Look at the stained glass on that building. That's, uh, that represents God. No, it doesn't. God does not dwell in temples made with hands still. Friend, the, the, the building is not the church. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 25 through 27 says, you are the body of Christ. You are the church of Christ. And members individually, one of another. You see, the problem, one of the reasons Israel got so mad is because they'd put so much of the religion into that temple. 
They would cry out in the days of Jeremiah, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Jeremiah 7 verse 4. Save us, O our sanctuary. He didn't stop Nebuchadnezzar from coming in and destroying it. Why? Because God didn't dwell in that temple. He dwells among his people. And friend, Stephen, although the people were getting irate already, although he knew it probably would not end well, he preached what needed to be heard. Stephen was not afraid to make his preaching plain. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2 says, Make it so plain that he who runs may read it. Stephen did just that. It was to the point. It was blunt. And yet it was exactly what these people needed to hear if they were going to, if he was going to break through that hard-hearted shell and help them to obey God. And so preaching Jesus means that we've got to tell people what to do. Were there consequences to that? Yeah. They, they gnashed at Stephen with their teeth. They took him out of the city. They stoned him to death. And he's what we think of as one of the first martyrs for the cause of Jesus Christ. But what a great man he was. And friends, sometimes when we preach Jesus, there's going to be problems with that. And the problems fold over into Acts chapter 8. Look at the last verse of Acts 7 and the first few verses of Acts chapter 8. Stephen knelt down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so here, Stephen dies. And that's a, a terrible scene. And yet, some of that had to bleed over into what happened with Saul. Saul is there consenting to his death. They laid their coats at the name of a young, a young man named Saul. He was there consenting to his death. Imagine Saul is cheering it on. He's holding their coats as they are stoning Stephen. And Saul begins to take uh, issue with the church as well. Saul's wreaking havoc on the church. He's dragging men and women out of their homes and committing them to, uh, to go to prison. He, he's like a wrecking ball trying to destroy the church, as it were. And yet, God's going to teach this man a lesson as well, as we'll further see in Acts chapter 9. But put Saul on hold for just a moment and watch how the gospel continues to grow. Acts chapter 8, verse 4, the Bible says, those who were scattered because of what Saul was doing, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word and I'm glad they did they didn't get they didn't when bad things happen they didn't give up they didn't throw in the towel they didn't get weak and, and tower cower they can they, they may have scattered but everywhere they went when they scattered guess what went with them the gospel and, and it's in this process that God uses to spread the gospel in the first century and one of God's servants Philip now goes to Samaria Acts chapter uh, 8 through 12 we mentioned is the gospel to Samaria and now Philip one of God's servants is going to go down to Samaria in the teaching of the gospel if you have your Bible look in chapter 8 Philip is teaching the gospel he is now in the region of Samaria great one Wonders are done through him. He preaches Christ. He preaches the kingdom. Verses 5 through 12. And many are obedient to that. And one of those is a man named Simon. Look at verse number 12 and 13. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. When he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, seeing the miracles and wonders that had been done. Now, this amazed Simon so much because Simon was a modern day con artist as it were. He was a magician. He was a trickster. He by sleight of hand could do things that nobody else could do. He'd been trained in that profession of magic or sorcery and now Simon hears the gospel. He believes that message. He obeys that. He himself is baptized and becomes a Christian and then he sees after becoming a Christian, somebody do a, a real bona fide miracle and he naturally lapses back to his old lifestyle. I'll give you money if you give me that power. And Peter now is going to discuss with Simon how he's fallen back into sin. So Peter says to him, your heart's not right with God. You're in the bond of iniquity. You're in the gall of bitterness. You've got neither part nor portion in this matter. You need to repent and pray that the evil thought of your heart might be forgiven you. What happens here serves as a great example 
of what a Christian does. This is often referred to as God's second law of pardon. The first law of pardon, forgiveness, is when one obeys the gospel, he repents and is baptized for the remission of his sins, Acts 2, verse 38. But what about when a Christian finds himself in sin? Well, this is God's second law of pardon. Acts 8, verses 20 through 28, we hear of how Simon sinned, and Peter told him to repent and pray so that he could be forgiven. A Christian, when he sins, he can still repent. Let, let's say as a child of God, you have some temptation, you fall in with that temptation, your life gets caught back up in sin again, and you realize you're in sin, and you know you got to get out of that. What do you do? You repent and pray. Acts chapter 8, verse 20 following. But friend, don't miss here a very powerful point as well. This example of Simon, as clearly as anything shows that a Christian can so sin as to be eternally lost. Now watch it with me. Look in your Bible in Acts chapter 8. I want you to hear what Peter says to Simon, who, who obeyed the gospel, who the Bible says believed and was baptized and became a Christian. Look, if you would, in verse 20. But Peter said to Simon, your money perish with you. Why? Look in verse 23. The Bible says, For I see that you're poisoned by bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Peter here clearly sees that he's got to turn him out of this, that he is bound, he's in sin, and he's got to come back to Jesus. And so what we see here is that Simon so sinned as to fall back into a lost state. Your money perish with you. And so, friend, a Christian can sin be bound by iniquity, and be in a lost state. The idea of once saved, always saved is clearly not taught in the Scripture. And so we hope today that these things have been beneficial, helpful to you. If you've never obeyed the gospel, you'd like to learn more about how to become a Christian, contact us. We'd be happy to study with you about that. Or if as a child of God, maybe there are things in your life you need to change like Simon did. Our encouragement is to repent and pray. If we can help you in any way, please join us next time as we study together. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, Internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.